by way of introduction, um, I just thought I'd give you a bit of a, a context for, our, for the forecasts that we provide. So twice a year, the Treasury uh, updates its economic outlook. Um, we produce one for what we call the half-year economic and fiscal update, which we uh, released in December, and we also do one in association with the budget. Uh, we're currently finalising our economic forecasts for the budget. We can't quite do that yet because we're, we're waiting on government to finalise its budget package. Um, we're encouraging them to do that this week so we can get on and um, do the, the, the economic forecasts and then, then the tax forecasts. So what I'm going to talk to you a wee bit about today is how we saw things back in December when we released our half-year economic and fiscal update. I'll also want to give you a bit of an update on what's happened since then because the world has moved on um, and I just wanted to you know, get, get you to understand some of the risks as they present themselves and the way that we see them. Um, a lot of the work that we do helps support policy analysis, whether that be tax or skills policy or labour market policy. And that affects many dimensions of the, the wellbeing framework that Diana talked about today. The living standards framework that we're trying to use, and in particular the dashboard, is, is a challenge for us um, as macroeconomists who think about things in a fairly orthodox manner. And so one of the things that we're, we're trying to do is think a little bit deeper about some of the distributional impacts um, and how, how the economy might, um, or how different elements or different parts of the economy might be affected um, over the next three to five years. So that's a real challenge for us um, as orthodox macroeconomists, getting into some of the different dim dimensions of um, the outlook. Um, as I said, uh, I'm going to give you a fairly candid overview of how we're seeing the, the economy. Um, I'm going to start with some fairly broad messages and reflect on how we were seeing things, uh, then give you a bit of an update, and then um, hopefully there'll be a bit of time for questions at the end. So, there we go. So to start with, back in December, uh, we were expecting the economy to continue expanding, uh, and this was very much underpinned by population-led growth. Uh, government spending and pretty accommodative monetary policy conditions. We were forecasting at that stage um, the government's books to be in pretty good condition, so rising Obergau surpluses over the forecast period. But we also mentioned a number of risks that we saw. And I think if anyone is reading the papers today, you'll understand some of those risks are very much presenting, in particular, the global outlook. But there are some things that are happening a bit more domestically too that are um, that will be worth worthwhile talking a wee bit more about. So, in December, when we published the economic forecast, we believed that the economy would expand at around at around two and a half to three percent per annum over the next four years. Um, what we were thinking is that. The economy is, is in a fairly mature state in its business cycle. So if you think over the last decade since the global financial crisis, New Zealand has actually had pretty good, um, pretty good growth in the economy, up, up to around 3, 3.5%, 4 And as a consequence of that, we've got closer and closer to what we would describe as capacity, and therefore the ability of the, the economy to continue to grow at three, three and a half, four percent is pretty limited. So as a consequence of those, a number of those sorts of things, uh, we see growth expanding, but certainly not at the same rate as we had, um, had done before. Um, also, we thought that the nominal, nominal economy would continue to expand, uh, in part due to a fairly elevated terms of trade. And, and the nominal economy is obviously pretty important for what happens to tax and tax revenue. We are expecting um, a pickup in wage growth. So after the three, uh, say over, over the last three to four years, you might have had wage growth averaging two and a half, three, or two and a half to three percent, and we thought that uh, wage growth would pick up to about three and a half percent over the forecast period. And there are a couple of things that uh, are underpinning that. 
in particular changes to government policy. Um, we've seen recently the, the increase in minimum wage, for example, was an example of that. So what's happened since December? Well, we've had a couple of, oh, a number of um, data outturns. In particular, GDP came in at around 6%, just slightly below what we had anticipated. If you look at growth over the last half of last year, it, it totaled about 1%. Now, over the previous four years, what we'd seen is in any half year period, growth had probably averaged closer to one5 two percent So that's just indicative of an economy that's just perhaps slowing down in, that, in its growth. Um, by comparison, uh, Australian GDP uh, in, that la in the last half of last year uh, de um, increased by about half a percent. So we're certainly growing, uh, expanding at a, close, uh, at a stronger rate than, than the likes of Australia. Um, when we take a little bit of a closer look at growth, we saw that growth was pretty broad based across most industries, with the exception of um, the primary sector, and that was largely a mining sector or a mining industry phenomenon. Um, and then we, when we look at consumption, on a consumption-based measure, we saw that private consumption in particular was supporting um, expenditure, uh, but that actually growth and expenditure GDP was also fairly broad-based. On a nominal basis, though, the terms of trade wasn't quite as strong as we'd anticipated, and, and nominal economy didn't quite grow as, as strongly as we had anticipated. Now, if we look a little bit closer at some of the other, other data that's printed, so the unemployment rate lifted, but what I mention here is that we got a surprisingly um, positive outturn for the labour market in September. So the unemployment rate actually fell below 4% to 3.9%. And we didn't think that was sustainable. So we've seen the unemployment rate just pick up again. Um, firms are still continuing, uh, continuing to report that it's really difficult to find their skilled and unskilled workers. And that's just reiterated by um, our business talks that we recently did. So prior to a forecasting round, we'll go out and talk to a range of businesses. Uh, and it's one of the key messages that we've heard over the last three to four years, and it's something that we're continuing to hear, that it is really difficult to find the right people for, for roles, um, right through the country, in fact. Um, some of the other data that's printed since then, so Capital goods imports is still increasing, and that's indicative of an economy that's still wanting to invest. Um, so business investment, whilst it slowed down, slowed down there's still evidence here that, that we're going to see continued growth in business investment. Um, and dairy exports have expanded on the back of what's been a really good production season. Although, you know, just after December, we've seen dairy prices come back a wee bit. Um, in the last couple of auctions, we've seen dairy prices um, pick up again, so that's a good sign. The high, high oil prices that we were confronted with in the late uh, latter part of last year have largely unwound, um, and the oil price, the, the international oil price, is around about $60 a barrel now. Last year, they got up to around $75, $80 a barrel. Um, oil price is inherently difficult to forecast, so we pretty much take whatever it is today and just straight line that, and that's our forecast for oil. Um, but probably the biggest news is what happened with the Reserve Bank. So prior to the last um, monetary policy statement, the Reserve Bank had, had taken a very neutral stance on monetary policy, and they said, well, depending on how things evolve, the next move in the OCR could be up or it could be down. A couple of weeks ago, though, they, they took a, a stronger view than that. They said it's most likely to be down. And they were talking about what's happening in the global economy as a, as a clear signal of how things are, how demand is shaping up um, and how they think not just the economy will unfold, but the level of activity um, that will translate into um, inflation. So at the moment, financial markets are pricing in 
two basis uh, or two um, two cuts in the OCR, so about fifty basis points. So currently the OCR is at um, one point seven five percent, and they're signalling or the markets are anticipating that it will come down to just just above one percent. Um, when that will happen, and well, even if it does happen, uh, largely depends on how things evolve from here, particularly, I think, in the international economy. Where are we up to? So now I just want to come back to some of those things that we think were important for growth in the economy over the next three to five years. So one of those things is population growth. I think what you want to take out of this is that our last migration cycle has been, when you look back historically, uh, a pretty strong migration cycle. So two things have happened here. We've had fewer people leave to Australia, and part of that reflects the fact that, at least in the mining sectors in, in Australia, um, it hasn't been as good, and therefore fewer New Zealanders have left to go to the mining sectors. But we've also had pretty good... Um, inbound migration from non-New Zealanders, coming into the workforce in particular. But we don't anticipate that to, um, to continue. In fact, we've got the migration cycle easing somewhat. So that's just not going to be as supportive to growth over the next three to five years as it has been over the past three to five years. Um, confounding these things, though, we've had some changes in data. So Stats New Zealand have released some some new measures of migration. And what that's signalling is that migration perhaps didn't reach um, as high a peak as we thought and may have eased quicker than we, or earlier than we had thought. Um, most recent data, though, is signalling a bit of a, a change, though. So maybe there are, uh, the decline in population, or well, migration isn't quite as pronounced as, as, it, as we had an anticipated. Um, on the flip side, if you think about this, what it also means is that per capita consumption and some of those things is probably higher than we had otherwise anticipated. So maybe it's not all a bad thing about um, what these new migration statistics mean. All right. Rising income support consumption. So we see a fairly strong outlook for consumption growth. Uh, in part p underpinned by a reasonably a reasonably buoyant labour market. So we've seen the unemployment rate decline from peaks of around 6.5% after the global financial crisis to around 4% now. And we anticipate that over the next four years that the unemployment rate will hover just around or just above 4%. Uh, with wage, wage growth, that's been supported by some changes in, in government policy. Um, and we can think of wage settlements and, and minimum wage as, as good examples of those. We think that there's you know, quite, strong in, um, sh quite strong growth in income that can support consumption growth. Um, we also see fairly accommodative um, monetary policy conditions too, which will keep things like mortgage, um, mortgage payments fairly low. Government supending, supporting um, demand. So we expect to see a fairly strong fiscal impulse. At Haifu, we were forecasting, and the government had announced uh, operating balances of 2.4 billion over the forecast period. Um, the government's still yet to pin down what its um, what its budget package is, um, but hopefully we'll expect to see that soon. Investment growth. So as I mentioned earlier, capacity constraints were one of the factors that we point to around why growth isn't going to be quite as strong as we had seen over the recent years. And I think the um, construction industry is an obvious example of that. Um, there just isn't the capacity in the construction industry um, to expand at a rate that um, we've seen over the last few years. You know, when we think about this, can, you know, constra um, consents are still at record levels. We saw 34,500 consents in the last 12 months. At the height of the 
construction boom, say, three or four years ago. I think we just peaked slightly higher than that. So that's evident of the fact that we are wanting to expand, um, but there's just limited capacity to do so at the moment. Part of that's an Auckland story, but we've seen um, seen similar sorts of things right across um, right across the New Zealand as well. Um, Non-residential investment, so we've got an elevated level of terms of trade and we think that that's reasonably supportive for business investment. Terms of trade you might think of as, um, as a proxy for profits. Uh, and so when profitability is, is high, well then we expect business investment to be strong. Um, one of the things that might weigh on that and probably has done a wee bit is the effects of business confidence. Um, so there was quite a lot of noise about the effects of weak business confidence on the economy last year, but we didn't see strong evidence of that. And it's true today that we don't see a great amount of evidence that suggests that weaker business confidence is genuinely translating into lower levels of activity. Um, but it is something that we think probably is weighing on, weighing on things at the margins. But when you look at some other factors that are going on, we've got really low um, real interest rates, which is positive for business. Um, and with um, perhaps wage growth picking up, it means that businesses might choose to um, substitute capital for labour. Uh, the government has also announced a $13 billion um, capital works envelope. Um, so that's a four-year programme. So that's, I think, helping, um, helping with planning decisions. So rather than having to, to look at a, a one-year um, investment window, uh, what you've got now is some of those large um, likes of NZTA or whatever who are able to plan over three to four years now with a bit more certainty than what they had done. And I want to talk a wee bit about the, um, the international economy because I think it's fair to say this is on watch. And it's no surprise if you watch the news that there are a number of things going on globally that are potentially a bit of a drag on the New Zealand economy. So we've heard quite a lot about um, China, US trade tensions, and this is a concern, but it's not as big a concern as you might think. What we're talking about here is the total, um, so I'll just put that down, the total amount of um, trade or bilateral trade between the US and China that's affected by the tariffs and the tariff wars you might describe them as is only about 10% of that bilateral trade. Um, it's even less when you think about it in world terms. It is a risk though and we're just keeping a, um, a mindful eye on what, what might happen there. Um, Brexit, so I mean, who knows exactly what's going to happen. Um, it'll be interesting to know soon. We've heard that there are more delays. Uh, there might be a, an exit package that's ratified, but they also they might there might be a no exit package. So the UK might leave the European Union without um, without a package in place. I don't know that we quite fully understand what the implications of that might be. Um, at the margins though, it will mean a change in some of the you know, historical preferential access arrangements that we have had to the likes of the UK market. Um, so when I think about that, I think about access to the UK market for um, mutton and lamb. So we have quite high quotas into the UK um, and we don't actually fill that now because the number of sheep in New Zealand has declined quite substantially over the last 20 years. Uh, and it's about four times as high as somewhere like Australia. So as things get renegotiated, some of our preferential access might be, um, might be just shortened up a wee bit. Um, the other thing that we, we also keep an eye on is what's happening with China, and in particular debt. Um, so the extent to which um, companies in the Chinese economy have to borrow is actually quite high at the moment. 
and if there are if there is a drag on the um, and on the Chinese economy, well then that could um, that could could crunch down on um, firms in in China, and that could have more of an impact on demand, in particular for or well, directly for New Zealand goods. Um, but also we're thinking about the contagion impacts, particularly through Asia and, and maybe into Australia as well. Speaking of Australia, so Australia's growth hasn't performed that well recently. And that's there's perhaps two phenomena that are that are a result of that. One is the Royal Commission on the on banks and how that they've shortened up access to funding. Uh, and that's caused a bit of a collapse in um, in the housing market. Housing prices have declined in real terms by about 15% to date, and a number of commentators are expecting house prices to decline up to 20%. That's quite a different sort of scenario than what we see in New Zealand. New Zealand typically don't, New Zealand, in New Zealand we don't typically uh, see real declines in house prices. What we see is people just taking their house off the market as prices soften. Um, the other thing that's happening in, in Australia is that the, the consumer isn't spending quite as much. But some of the other things are actually going pretty well in Australia. So business investment is still chugging along. And um, the export sector is doing really well on the back of some pretty strong commodity prices. Um, so it's not all, all bad uh, when you think of Australia. So what we'd say at the moment is that things aren't translating into a crisis yet. So we're seeing what's happening in the global economy as a bit of a soft landing, certainly not a crash landing. If there were a whole bunch of things to come together though, it might look a bit more like a, a I wouldn't say a crash landing, but uh, maybe a hard landing anyway. The other thing that I'll just mention here is inverted yield curves. I don't know if anyone's sort of taking notice of this. A lot of commentators, particularly in the US, say that when you get um, long rates that are higher than short rates, it's an indication that the economy is heading towards recession. And if you look back um, over the US economic history, you do see, see this, but there are, I think, some key points of differences with what's happening in the, in the US now and what's happened over history. Firstly, the spreads are only about 50 basis points, um, and it's only been for a very short period of time. Over history, what you've seen is that the spreads um, and the inverted um, yield curve blow out to about 250 basis points, and it be, can be for an, a, a prolonged period of time. So we're not certainly, I think, in a scenario where we're talking about a, a US recession. Um, I'm going to skip over that slide because I think I've covered points there. Um, I did want to talk a wee bit about the impact of um, a softening world outlook on New Zealand. Um, and so we've got, we've got the main channel, the demand channel, but it also affects prices as well. And, and in particular, one of the things that we think a bit harder about is what's happening with the terms of trade. So as you can see in this chart here, the terms of trade over the last 20 years has been on an upward trend. And there are two things that are going on here. Um, the price for our exports has generally increased at a faster rate than the price of imports. And so, and that's largely a proteins story on the export side of things. Um, but we also import a whole range of goods. And they generally aren't increasing at a, the same price or the same rate as some of our um, commodity exports. And we expect this to, to remain so. So when you look at in market um, supply and demand conditions for the likes of wood, meat, and dairy, uh, things are still pretty good. Um, there's still strong demand, particularly for for wood and dairy into China. Um, and supply conditions for the likes of dairy in, um, in the Northern Hemisphere, still pretty favorable for, for New Zealand uh, dairy farmers. Um, what else do I want to say there? 
Now that's probably about it. Yeah. Um, before I finalise my discussion and, and come back to what it means for the government's finances, I just thought I'd talk a wee bit about tax developments. So we've been continually surprised at the amount of tax that the economy has generated over the last three to four years. We, we continually under forecast tax. Um, part of that's been a business tax story. But when we look at year to date tax numbers, what are we seeing? So GST is slightly higher or slightly ahead of forecast. Um, corporate taxes, though, are slightly behind forecast. <coughs> Excuse me. We think that um, the corporate tax story is largely a provisional tax thing that will wind its way out as we um, conclude the, the fiscal year. So, overall, we think that the, the government's books will continue to improve over the forecast period. Um, so we, we're now in, in surplus and we expect that to be maintained. Um, but that requires tax receipts to remain reasonably robust and also it requires a measure of fiscal discipline from the government. 